session um, on worldwide revolution. Uh, and the said to me, how does this fit in with the um, theme of the conference, innovation? <laughs> <laughs> Which, being a journalist, I can certainly give two answers. The first one is that it doesn't, so we should just enjoy this break for an economics and uh, deal with politics. As some of you have started with green politics, philosophy, and economics many years ago, I think that's always good thing. So if you're interested in politics, you should go it that way. But in a way, we, of course, we are talking about innovation, we're not rationalizing. We're talking about political innovation and where it leads, positive and negative direction. Um, it's a long time, actually, since I've thought seriously about revolution. But when I was in my youth, I used to be a historian before I became a journalist. I used to think quite a lot about it, and I had a friend who was a radical fashionable concept these days in the West, of course. Um, I think it's 1917 revolution. Uh, it's a decade or something. It's probably what some people would say where 1789 revolution didn't help either. But we're focusing on different parts of the world. This has been more encouraging developments recently. We've got a good revolution in Eastern Europe. And the particular focus we have today is the Arab Spring and its aftermath. Um, I don't pretend to be an expert on this. Um, speaker who approached me to address that was uh, Desmond Omar, who is the CEO of Bayer of the CIP. Thank you. Um, so I guess when we were uh, meeting beforehand, we sort of talked about the different viewpoints that we had on the region, um, and I'm, I'm going to be the optimist of, of the three. So we're going to start you off on a happy note and then slowly bring you down. Um, that's, the, that's the plan of action. <laughs> Can we switch it? It's innovative new thinking approach is, is the motto of INET, so we're going to try it this way. Uh, I wanted to really get at some of what I think are the big questions that I hear about in terms of what are the Arab Spring and the Arab uprisings. And I'm going to start off with one. You know, why do we experience the Arab revolutions? And, and I'm very much uh, sensitive about the kinds of terms that we use. It is a revolution. I think there's something going on in the region today that is unique. It's fascinating, it's very exciting, um, and it's because of the youth of the region that I think really we need to be optimistic. And, and for very simple terms, the demographic reality is they will be the majority. And we are looking today where the majority of the population today is at 60% of the population under the age of 35. That's gonna just get better and better. And I do think that there's an, you know, an important role uh, for the youth of the Arab world, and if you're excited about the Arab youth as I am, you'll see why there's lots of hope for their future. So the Arab youth, I think, were, um, like we saw on, our, on the images on our television screen, really wanting accountable government. They want representative governments. They want to know where their tax dollars are going. The days of uh, sort of preaching to them that, you know, you don't know, you know, leave it to us, the elders, we know what we're doing, just doesn't satisfy them anymore. The Arab world is increasingly educated, um, here's another myth that I'm going to bust for you. Uh, there are more women in post-secondary education than Arab men. Um, it's not to the image that we have, particularly in the, in, in the West, about somehow you know, Afghanistan where women you know, don't read or write. Post-secondary education is increasing the most rapidly in the world in the Middle East. Okay? The highest rate of growth in terms of uh, post-secondary education, particularly among women, is in the Arab world. We also know that the Arab world is not only more increasingly educated, they're hyper-connected, and that is a really important part of it. And I don't want to re-emphasize this, you know, it's always a cliche for those of us who stay in the Middle East to keep talking about the Twitter revolution, Facebook. It didn't start then, it started with Al Jazeera, it started with satellite television, it started with the whole opening of understanding what's happening out there. And I want to emphasize this because, you know, it used to be kind of easier for leaders in the Middle East to basically get away with, you know, driving their Ferrari in Italy and not being seen. That doesn't happen anymore. The images are loaded in real time. That type of corruption is exposed. And I think that the Arab world increasingly has access, not only to the images, but to the philosophy, to the ideas. And they just don't 
want to accept, I think, the old so social contract or the old bargain that they had made with their rulers, which was, you know, you be quiet, we provide to you, and um, so don't ask for any rights. Increasingly, we have to admit that the sort of the, the neoliberal time of the 1990s where there were a lot of cutbacks in social welfare and a lot of services and bringing in that kind of neoliberal economic thinking of basically pull up your bootstraps and fend for yourself, which is great, but that also means that the old social contract of I, um, you know, I provide for you and, and you keep quiet doesn't resonate anymore. And this is across the board. I think one of the things that we have as a myth as well is that somehow in the Gulf countries, which is the biggest sort of state welfare you can think of in terms of the oil shakedowns just doling out all these lovely gifts to its citizens, that somehow it's not affecting them. It's affecting them as well. Uh, you know, Saudi Arabia has a large population of poor people. Housing crisis in Saudi Arabia is on, on the rise. All of these, I think, point to frustrations of the masses who say, you know what, again, the old bargain doesn't sit anymore. And not to mention, I think, the kinds of escapism that so many governments in the past have used, i.e. blaming everything from capitalism to, uh, frankly, you know, terms like Americanism and, and Zionism and colonialism, all these isms, all these structural explanations that for so long the Arab world had depended on to explain the lack of development doesn't resonate anymore. You know, particularly the young, they're like, mm, you know, I don't buy that. The reason why that I don't have a productive job is not just because of all the isms, it's also because you have also taken from the public purse. There's a reason why you have a Ferrari and, and traveling around in southern Italy. That is my Ferrari, so to speak. And I think that resonates. And I'm proud of the young Arab people who continue to fight for that dignity. They're fighting for economic productivity. They're fighting for a more prosperous place in their societies. They want a more liberal political and uh, ideological space. And I reject the idea that somehow that can't be married with Islam, because very much it can be. I think it's a new approach of Islam. In fact, one of the things that I'm very proud of in the Middle East is how the new young Muslim movements are. I mean, these are you know the, the most passionate preachers nowadays on, on television, on radio, are increasingly these progressive young preachers who talk about you know Islam in terms of love, in terms of you know the great advancements of, of scientific philosophy in Islam, and, and not just hearkening to the past, but also thinking in terms of progressive ways. So I really think that there's a lot going on to be proud of. So. That's why I think the Arab, you know, the Arab revolutions happened. It was an awakening in so many terms, an awakening because it, it's basically questioning the basic premise of the social contract. And that's why I'm optimistic. And that takes me to my second question. And we need to be optimistic because again, that's the majority of the population. Look at the demographic uh, map of the Middle East and you will see that in 20 to 30 years, the sort of old philosophy of those isms and blaming it on a generation of of you know, Cold War policies just doesn't resonate anymore. There's a reason why we saw apathy, for example, even I could talk about Egypt in a while, where we saw apathy in the last two referendums of the youth. And there's a reason, because they don't want sort of uh, the same kind of, of, of um, um, dichotomous narrative of somehow blaming the West and blaming um, Western powers as always the explanation for things. Third, do we see a real change in the Middle East? Absolutely. And it's really in the mindset of the young. If we look at the Arab barometer, if we look at some of the world uh, or the Arab uh, value survey, some of the thinking of the Arab youth is really remarkable and changing quite rapidly. They do have a different approach to what they want to see. They have a different concept of family. We are seeing urbanization at a rapid rate uh, throughout the entire Arab world that didn't exist before. So in the 1950s, when someone in a Jordanian family was expected to marry their cousin, and today they migrated to the city where uh, they, you know, all those primordial kinds of, of you know, ascriptive uh, um, uh, um, identities of, of tribe, of, of sect, all of these are being broken down bit by bit. Now, one of the things that my grandmother, you know, this old beautiful Jordanian woman, uh, taught me was this wonderful proverb that to every day, whenever I get pessimistic about the Middle East, I stop and I say, and in Arabic it's, it translates, and, and uh, if there's any Arabs in the room, it's shara ala shara biyamlu dahiya. And it's this idea that if you add a hair to a hair, you get a beard. <laughs> and it's a wonderful saying because too often we forget about these little things that we see along the way. And you know, you have to remember that 
You just have to put these little pictures together and you get a very different tableau. And we too often, I think, focus on so much of the negativity of the region and forgot the essence of what made us, I think, very thrilled to see some of these beautiful young people, for example, taken to Tahrir and to other places in public squares, demanding for more accountable governments. That spirit has gone nowhere. It's there. It's alive and well. Has it hit some bumps along the road? Absolutely. I am not going to deny that there are some serious political challenges. I think there's some serious political challenges in Egypt today. I think there's some serious political challenge in Libya. But even in Libya, and this is the one case that you know people too often point out and say, well, you know, Libya, look how bad it turned out. I say, no, Libya turned out fine. It could have been Syria. Can we please think about what really could have been the counter narrative? The counter narrative could have been 150,000 killed. And, and Gaddafi was very well willing to do that. The majority of the Libyans today survey, 70% are optimistic about the future, think the revolution was worth it by far. This is a country of 7 million people with 2% of the world's oil wealth. There is no reason why this country can't succeed today. There's a lot of promise there. Are there bumps along the road? Yes. But that's not because of the current people in place. That's because Gaddafi did everything to destroy civil society. He did everything to not even have the kind of functioning military that could take over in the national security space. All of those are the people that I think that are really responsible, not the current, I think, government and those who are trying to build their country for the better. Finally, is it over? No. Uh, and I think this is really important. I don't want to uh, leave you with this idea that somehow we've entered the Islamist winter. I, I, to me, I despise that term. It you know, connotes so much negativity, not only for uh, um, what I think is uh, a, a very orientalist view of the region and somehow assume that Islam cannot be a progressive force, I think it very much can be, but also it really, I think, undermines the agency of the people in the region. Uh, I think that there is a lot of promise and I think that the region is at the beginning. And you know, history has a long evolution, long uh, time scale here, and I think in 20 years we'll be looking back and looking at what happened in, in 2010 and 2011 as being the beginning um, I see at the beginning the conversation of people in the Middle East is different today than it ever was. Uh, again, it's about what, if, what are you, the government in the Middle East, going to do for me, the people? That's the, that's the beginning of the conversation. People are no longer willing to accept that somehow they need to put their head down and just accept their lot. That is an awakening. That is a beautiful thing for the region, and I very much think it's a revolution. Thank you. Um, next speaker is um, Mustafa Nabli, the former governor of the Central Bank of Tunisia. And he tells me he's going to talk about the current situation as well and also related to the history of the region. And uh, he's been billed as part optimistic, part pessimistic. So we shall see. new, what's different, what's, uh, what has happened in terms and not why it happened and so on, because that's a long story. And, uh, so uh, looking back, I have been thinking about it and uh, looking over the last century or so and what kind of revolutions and, and uprisings have been happening in the region and so on. And uh, broadly speaking, uh, there have been a lot of uprisings over the last century or so, century and a half in the region. Uh, some of them even called revolutions. Uh, and uh, all kinds uh, from those, uh, you know, from the early 20th century and uh, the Arab Revolt of 1916, 1918, to the uh, revolutions and uh, uprisings against the colonial powers, 
and the uh, uprisings against the governments over the last 50 years and so on. So lots of things have been happening. So but what I thought was really new and, dif and different is that what has happened in 2011 uh, brings together five main features which we have never seen before together. They're different. And uh, that's really what's new and, and different. First, we have seen these events were sudden and unexpected uprisings. It's not the first time that happens. It happens in some other cases. But these were sudden and unexpected. Uh, and they were, and uh, unlike many cases before, uniquely popular. They were not organized. They had no leadership, no organization, no individuals, no ideological background. This is this is second characteristic, which was extremely important to, to put together. And the third was the contagion effect. Contagion effect means that the uprisings were very quickly spread from one country to the other, at least for few, few countries. And uh, at least six countries were heavily, strongly influenced, but even the others were influenced in many different ways, not so strongly. The third and the fourth uh, characteristic or feature is that in many cases, and this is was unprecedented as well, they led to a quick and precipitous collapse of many existing regimes. Regimes which would have been very difficult just a few days before, or a few weeks before, to think they would have collapsed so quickly. And we had at least four countries where the collapse was, was very uh, quick and, and abrupt in Tunisia, clearly Egypt, uh, and Jordan and Yemen, uh, not so quick, but as well happened. And, uh, and, and but eventually in Libya uh, was it took a war and uh, in um, in Syria as well. But at least four countries there was major and very quick change in the political regimes uh, following that. The fifth feature uh, is that uh, the demands were clear of the. Uh, of the youth, but that's what I was talking about, especially the youth were driving these, these uprisings. Uh, but on the other hand, they were broad. They were not very specific. They were talking about bread, about uh, dignity, about uh, freedom, about, uh, you know, uh, against corruption and things like that. So they were very broad principles. They were not asking for specific things. Like in many cases before, like there were many uprisings where people are asking for you know, lower prices of bread and protesting against increasing price of bread or increasing price of gasoline or, or this. In this case, the demands were very clear, very, uh, very obvious, but they were very broad in character. Now, why I'm saying this about these are five features which together are a new phenomenon. We have never seen this happen before. So in this sense, in, may, in many ways, uh, the uprisings, these uprisings are not history repeating itself. They are new. They are fundamentally a new development. They are an innovation in the social and political realm of the region as well. The question is, what about the implications? What happened afterwards, because what I have been talking about is the few months, the first semester of 2011, say, three to six months of 2011. Now the question is what happened afterwards? Is the follow-up, is what happened in the evolution of events afterwards any different from what would have been expected? Now here, I would say that my main message is that I would like to distinguish between the medium-term and the long-term implications. My, I don't know, my message or my hypothesis or whatever you call it is that Sadly enough, the events which have unfolded since the uprisings would strongly, as of now, as of what we know today, after three years, would point to some, to even to an outcome that is similar to many other cases, to that of I mean, many other cases in history. It means that the Arab uprisings are not going to lead soon to open and democratic societies or to more political development in the Middle East. So I'm pessimistic. On the other hand, my other message is that when we look at a deeper level, the recent uprisings have the potential to drastically change the future of the region in the long run. So I'm relatively 
pessimistic in the medium term, short and medium term, and I'm optimistic for the long term. And let me explain why. So this is the gray hair that I'm raising for the uh, So let's talk about the transition, the medium term, short to medium term. I think the short to medium term transition has run into four or five major challenges which have made it messy, costly, and is likely to lead to unwelcome uh, outcomes in the medium term. First, the first challenge is the standard counter-revolutionary pressures that would come from any movement like this. The, the groups that were benefiting from the old system were eventually are going to act and react and uh, will try either to slow down or to reverse the process. And we have seen this in different degrees, in different degrees, different ways in the different countries. But these are certainly there, and the most obvious case is the Syria case, where very quickly the regime reacted and fought back and has been uh, you know, uh, pushing back. But we see this in other cases as well. We see it in, in Libya, we see it in, uh, somewhat in, uh, in Egypt, we see it in, uh, in, many, in a strong way in, in Yemen, and, and we see some of it in Tunisia as well. So this is making the, the process uh, difficult and messy. The second challenge is, is also a standard one, and which we have seen in standard democratic transitions, where because of the very nature of what I talked about in terms of five features makes this, this events difficult to work out. Uh, democratic transitions uh, lead to various groups trying to shape the new rules because essentially you break the old rules and you want to establish a new system and you want to agree on new rules, whether through constitutional process, through rules of the game, in terms of uh, social behaviors and so on. But getting to agree on new rules is no, nothing that is easy. And we have seen fights over these new rules. And this is leading to a lot of strains and tensions in the political and social domain. And this is making the transition very difficult. The third, the third part of the, of, of the challenges is the economic risks. We have been seeing economic risks increase because the very nature of the events, the uprisings, had a negative impact initially on the economy, and this eventually translated in uh, a number of problems, uh, pressures on the fiscal uh, situation, on the, uh, in some cases on the, on the banking systems, uh, lower growth, high unemployment, uh, increase in poverty. Uh, all of those things make the transition more difficult. And what I'm more concerned about is the interaction about the first three, about the economic risks, economic difficulties, the tensions in the political process, the counter revolutionary forces, and, and this make a mixture and feedback loops which might be undermining the process at a very deep level. And these are three major events which are. So the first three problems are standard. We, we have seen them in most political transitions and so on. What is new, what is different in the case of the Arab uh, uh, uprisings is that we have seen very quickly the emergence of polarization, social polarization, which has translated political polarization against the role of religion and religious uh, groups in the political process. The, uh, this is a long outstanding problem which dates back to you know, a century and a half which have come back to the fore, which is the fight between the secular, the secular forces and the traditional conservative uh, religious uh, forces. And this has come to, to uh, in many ways, to, uh, to the top of the agenda. We have seen it in Egypt, we have seen it in uh, Tunisia in, in the most pure form of life, but it's present as well in Libya, it is present in Yemen, Syria. And this made the transition extremely complex and even more difficult and more costly and messy. And I don't want to talk too 
challenge about the fifth challenge, which is the external interference. In all cases, especially in the Middle East, in Nigeria, there are a lot of external interference from the different powers these that have an interest in this. So all of this together, all of these challenges are, are making and will make the transition difficult. And so moving into a situation where we're going to have stable democratic regimes in the medium, the short medium, is going to be very difficult. We're going to go through a very difficult process of difficult economic conditions, difficult and stable political system, unstable uh, social uh, problems, and so on. So the media, the short to medium term is messy, it's going to be costly, and we, are going to see, we, are not, we have not seen the end of it now. However, the same features, this, I mean, the same five features, which to a large extent are the cause of this, because the reason we have many of these things don't didn't work themselves out clearly, it's because of the nature of the uprisings. The fact that there was no leadership, there was no clear agenda, made this possible to happen, and did not allow for a smoother transition, a better transition in some way. So on the other hand, what I would like to make is that the same feature and the same events that have been happening that are making the transition difficult have in themselves the seeds of a potential major change in the future of the region. And let me try to explain this, and this may be not sufficiently uh, understood. I think there are four major things which have been happening which are fundamental for the future of the region and they are working themselves. The first is now we have a credible threat, given the experience of the uprising, that against any non-accountable autocratic government in the future. It has been proven that the people are able to undertake on their own and rise against an accountable and autocratic regime. And this is, rulers have to learn this, have learned this, and they will always remember that. The second thing is that we have seen in action, as well as in the polls, but also in what people are doing on the seas, the preference of the populations of the Arab world for democracy has been amply tested and accepted, and even though it may weaken temporarily, but it is strong. And the idea that some have been you know, expanding, there's some exceptionalism, of the Arab world has been completely now uh, discounted and forgotten. This is a major, major thing that we have to see. The third, the third thing is that for the first time in the history of the region, an open and profound debate is taking place between the secularists and the Islamists. And this debate has started about a century and a half ago but it has never laid itself in the open in a democratic process. But it is taking place now in different ways, sometimes messy ways, but this debate is taking place. And it has, this debate is really, for me, is at the source of the evolution, political evolution of the last century. And it has been driving that. And this debate is taking place and it's working itself out in the open for the first time history of the region. The fourth event, which is this uh, fourth feature or the fourth, uh, the fourth um, component of the argument is that the Islamist ideology, which has pretended all along for a century or so that it holds the solution for the region's problems, has had this time the opportunity to be tested on the ground. <coughs> and it has been found wanting. It, is not the, it has not delivered. And this is going to push the Islamist politicians or the Islamist groups to rethink the way of engaging society and engaging with the rest of society. And this is the basis for any future democratic process to take root in, in the region. So these four features or these four evolutions, if you like, are extremely important in terms of trying to uh, work out the uh, implications of what has been happening for the future.
therefore my conclusion is that we are in for a rough ride. It's difficult, it's messy, it's gonna be difficult over the coming period. We're gonna, it's not linear, but I think we are seeing the seeds of a potential uh, rooting uh, and, uh, democracy, rooting itself in the region in a profound way, and the process working itself out in a positive way. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks very much. is uh, Sandra Halperin, who is a professor of international relations at the University of London. And she tells me she's going to take the uh, big picture approach. sociology of global development. So I feel um, somewhat like a fish out of water here. Uh, but that involves looking at the development of all regions in association with each other. And on the basis of a great deal of recent research, uh, research and writing by specialists of specific regions of the world, but also of uh, world and, and global historians, which is forcing a real rethinking of standard historical narratives. And in that way, perhaps, uh, I can make a modest contribution to new economic thinking by um, confronting some of the profound myths that pass as, historical, uh, uh, as a, the historical record on which much of current economic thinking, and particularly thinking about development, uh, is based. Um, so I want to um, uh, engage uh, with two elements of this panel. First of all, uh, with the uh, program material that references um, the perhaps the fruitfulness of comparison between European revolutions and, and contemporary recent events in contemporary Middle East, uh, which I'm, I'm happy to uh, reflect on in as much as the Middle East and Europe are the two regions of the world that have the most in common with each other, more than any, any other regions of the world. And that's unsurprising because m much of what we think of as European uh, actually didn't originate in Europe at all, but came from the Middle East. Uh, and uh, even when it was adopted uh, in Europe, rather uh, late in the story of modern development, modern global development, uh, it wasn't really a dominant um, uh, feature of European uh, experience. So it's not surprising that there's, there are some commonalities and um, comparisons that might be fruitfully made. And, and so I'll be uh, speaking in comparative terms. And also, I'm happy to engage with the theme of uh, revolution and um, recurrence. And certainly, students of history are very often aware of um, the fact that things that have occurred in the past tend to recur. Uh, of course, technology, technological advance, means that we're never in exactly the same world. But because there are sort of social logics, processes, and social a life that recur, we're never an entirely different one. So um, I have to um, give this pitch to my students. I teach a year-long course on the Middle East, and um, I start back with Persian, Byzantium, and the birth of Islam, which I see as the birth of modernity. Uh, and um, they have to spend a full uh, semester before we even reach the 20th century. But I'm not going to do that today, although <laughs> um, I want to talk about um, recurrence. Uh, and repetition and revolution. And I was looking for pictures uh, for a lecture on the Arab Spring and I came across this and um, it sort of rang a bell. It looked awfully familiar to me. And then I went uh, looking through my, my teaching files and found another uh, slide on a PowerPoint that I'd used earlier in the semester um, and it looked like this. Um, maybe I can toggle that back and forth. You see, it's really quite eerily similar uh, no, I'm not getting it back and forth. Eerily similar to, um, in terms of substance and composition, even of course the military equipment uh, is the same. And this last one is uh, from 2011 in Egypt. And um, this other one, of course, uh, is 1952 in Egypt. 
And uh, I found it sort of startly, startlingly similar. You know, the same sort of, um, I mean, the lone um, uh, young person throwing something at that um, cordon of, of uh, public servants. <laughs> and, um, but I, I also, found, um, also found really poignant um, the caption, Al-Thor uh, al-Mithri uh, al-Kadima, uh, the Egyptian revolution is coming. And poignant in terms of the decades that followed this revolution, the subsequent decades. And also poignant in, in terms of um, the hopes and expectations of uh, activists and observers of recent events in the region. And I think those hopes are really uh, linked to perhaps um, the hope that something's been set in motion that's going to lead to real durable transformative change. Uh, not just in terms of greater freedom, but in terms of a government that can bring about a really profound change in the circumstances of life for um, the masses. And um, so I want to sort of stand back a little bit and um, look at what it is that brings about transformative change. And here some socioeconomic history uh, might um, help us to see what it is that has brought about transformative change um, and what it is that has just inaugurated a long process of counter-revolution. Um, and um, let's see, I guess this um, image is what I was sort of after. I was looking at all of the, um, certainly all of the discussion and debate from abroad, from outside of the region that focused on the departure of these heads of state. But I had to ask my question, the question as a student of history and of global political economy of whether the weeds, the top of the weeds had been pulled out, leaving these roots in place. And I guess that really goes to the heart of what I want to get at here, that regime changes sometimes change the faces in the capital city, uh, and um, sometimes those faces are somewhat familiar, but they change clothes from military to civilian clothes. Uh, but that there are very, very durable structures that remain. And again, I've been haunted by 1952 as well. So I, I want to get to, without really imposing any kind of pessimistic overarching view here, I just want to explore what it is that brings about the kind of transformative change that I think hopes and expectations are linked to. Uh, and that's what I want to talk about, those roots and how deeply entrenched and extensive they are. And some of the political economic structures that have been developing over a very long time that are still perhaps there untouched and may remain untouched. Um, and I, I suppose since I started with um, 1952 and, and um, then this, um, the events recently in the Middle East, I, I, I probably should take a moment just to, to respond to um, Mustafa Nabli, um, who has now given me quite a difficult task in, in trying to, to make this kind of uh, comparison or linkage between the past and the present. Um, and he said, well, uh, recent events were very sudden and un unexpected. And I thought that what, what really drew me into the study of the Middle East was uh, I happened to wander into a room and see the Iranian Revolution on television. Uh, of course, I was an infant, but uh, not really. But it was uh, really an extraordinary thing to see people in the street uh, making and remaking their own history. And what really began to capture my interest in the days and weeks and months that followed is how very sudden and unexpected it seemed. All the intelligence services and all of the people in academia, in which I eventually <laughs> signed on to in order to study Iran and the Iranian Revolution, uh, uh, all of the conflict researchers, uh, except for a few Aramco um, officials that began living in 78, it seemed very sudden and unexpected, as did the seizure of the Grand Mosque in, in Mecca following that, which was much less publicized, but really sent shock uh, waves through the halls of power and, and many other things that followed. And then um, the, the, the notion that there's, um, that this was a popular up, um, uprising with no leaders. Uh, I think that's really interesting, really interesting, because in 52, 
Oh, those masses in the street, that, there's a million of people in the streets of Cairo were very well organized. There were peasant associations and student associations and unions and the Communist Party and Socialist Parties and syndicalist movements, et cetera, et cetera. But there is something that's fallen under the radar screen again in Egypt, as it did perhaps in Iran, which is all those medium and small um, sort of um, uh, violent uh, conflict events that people don't seem to follow with great attention. And it seems that there has been a lot of union organizing, and particularly a, a whole spate of, of uprisings and, and real activism in the textile uh, sector in particular, which I find very positive. Uh, but I still think it's an interesting point. Um, and then uh, the point about um, a contagion. Well, I think the idea of coup contagion in, in the social sciences actually came from the Middle East. If you can recall all those coups in Syria and coups and then the revolutions of the 1950s, I think we have seen this kind of contagious effect. And then the, the quick collapse of regimes. Well, again, looking at this picture, these regimes have collapsed. But again, I'm asking about what are the roots of these people's power? And have these regime changes gotten to those roots? Um, and I think that the events in 1952 also were very broad social demands. This was that classic fusion, as in Europe and other regions, of nationalist demands, you know, Egypt for the Egyptians and the British out. But that totally merged with a sense that uh, British and Egyptian elites were part of uh, the same imperium, which I think was absolutely true. And that nationalism is often the banner under which uh, a social revolution uh, is, is uh, pursued. So, okay, I'll leave that behind for a moment and, and, and then say something um, about why I'm broadly concerned about whether what's happening in the region has gotten to these roots. And so I want to talk about um, worldwide revolutions, which is, is, is what we're, need, we're supposed to engage with here, or at least um, it, it challenges someone with my background to engage with it. And I wanted to um, think of some kind of worldwide revolution and what it really represented, how, how it got inscribed in history and how we invoke it today and how we use it as a comparative focus for understanding the potentialities of revolutionary uprisings that we've seen as, for instance, recently in the Middle East. So I thought about a global revolution, which is, uh, as someone remarked uh, contemporaneously, uh, an event in the, in the human mind which was a global revolution, which we call the French Revolution, um, th that precipitated a global war uh, and really changed very little. Um, uh, obviously, there was a restoration in France. There was reaction almost everywhere else. And it set in train a century of counter-revolution. Because though it changed very little, obviously, the political structure of Europe changed, but not its social structure, which I think is part of the real story of the Middle East since the demise of the Ottoman Empire a change in political structure, uh, but structures consolidated under hundreds of years of Ottoman rule uh, were left undisturbed uh, in, in many crucial ways. But uh, what the French Revolution did was to inspire a deathly fear in what was an increasingly interconnected global elite, uh, a fear of revolution. And so there really was 100 years of revolution. And I wanted to say that the counter-revolution is what we uh, have wrongfully called uh, not a revolution at all, but the Industrial Revolution, a phrase that was retroactively applied to that time, and historians at the time um, um, objected strenuously that that was a, a profound misstatement and misrepresentation of what had happened. All the technology of the, of the Industrial Revolution really was associated with the 16th century. There was large-scale um, industrial ma uh, uh, mechanized manufacturing in Europe and Asia at the time. But what it was is something that will sound eerily familiar to you uh, as we're uh, exploring um, um, uh, revolution and recurrence. And that was a counter-revolution which involved an economic reorganization. That was the deregulation of markets and capital, the end of the national welfare systems and moral economies that had characterized uh, a number of countries in Europe and also elsewhere in Afro-Eurasia the deindustrialization of rural areas and concentration of production in what today we call global cities and city regions. And what these policies together did was to enable Europeans 
to launch a brutal expansion of production for export that became a model for elites and ruling groups throughout the world. Uh, and the reason for this is something that elites expressed in a lot of the literature at the time, and particularly the, the economics, uh, the economists in their journalistic literature picked up this discourse not only in Europe but in Asia about having to halt the democratization of consumption. And if elites were going to get wealthy by industrially producing goods and services, it better be for people who are not local, for settler communities elsewhere, for governments, ruling groups. Let it be railroads and armaments and telegraphs and docks, things that governments can, can buy. Okay. And in fact, um, that's, um, that's exactly the model of what a dependency theorist call um, you know, depend idiosyncratic contemporary third world development that became the model in Britain, in Europe, and all over the world. Uh, 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 obviously, the city of London was like the advanced sector of a dependent third world economy, uh, building strong linkages between British export uh, industries and foreign economies rather than integrating the local economy. Uh, and consequ uh, consequently, on the eve of the world wars, uh, it, Britain was described as um, consisting of small islands of luxury and ostentation surrounded by a sea of mass poverty and misery. The upshot of all that is that developmental trajectories around the globe are very similar. So what we should be asking is what changed and why in some very restricted parts of the world and what didn't change in places like the Middle East. Well, what changed and what became the developed world uh, were those that experienced a social revolution in the course of, third world, uh, of the, the world wars. That is a mobilization of the masses to fight those wars and a mobilization of workers for the industry to support that. And there was a social revolution that shifted uh, social power in Europe and a few other countries uh, that made uh, restoration and reaction impossible, whether under uh, labor governments or conservative governments. And that was, for a time, a real social revolution. Social revolution was also engineered by the US in vulnerable East Asian countries, in which there was a radical transformation of, struct of structures uh, radical agrarian reform, uh, legislation that um, governed investment by multinationals, et cetera, et cetera. But those measures were never promoted or advocated in any other part of the world other than those countries that were frontline countries in the geostrategic encirclement of the Soviet Union. Instead, uh, what was promoted and what has continued to be promoted today are policies that are just the opposite of what brought about phenomenal prosperity and a stable democracy in the so-called developed world. Um, first of all, there was the Cold War that eradicated all those forces uh, in the Middle East that in other regions were at the vanguard of movements for broad-based development uh, and democratization, not only communists and socialists, but any group, center or slightly right of center that called for land reform or the sorts of reforms that we associate with broad-based dynamic development and greater freedoms. Uh, and then when we look at all the sorts of things that the world wars inaugurated in the so-called developed world, um, the growth of the power of working classes relative to that of other classes, relatively more nationally embedded uh, capital, the developing development of purchasing power among a mass domestic citizen workforce that makes pass possible uh, new mass consumer goods industries and the extension and integration of domestic markets, policies that desi are designed to increase domestic investment, a more equitable distribution of income, welfare policies that had been dismantled in Europe in the, 18th, in the 19th century and then resumed after 1945. None of these features uh, are prominent in the vast literature devoted to development and the requisites of democracy, nor are the outcomes envisioned by the initiatives promoted by Western governments, NGOs, and international organizations. So, okay, something can change, right? We're all moving now to a global developed world, but no, uh, I think not. Um, I think that uh, starting in the 70s, uh, that part of the world that we call the developed world began to roll back the changes that had been put in place after World War II, the Second World as well, so that rather 
the, then the third world becoming more integrated to a global first world. We're seeing just the opposite. We're seeing the developed world, both the first and second world, sort of rolling back and assuming the same structures that before the world wars were part of the historical normal pattern of capitalist development. So that I think as time goes by, we are going to see the 1950s and 1960s as a kind of brief interregnum, two or three decades in which social revolutionary changes in a few areas of the world tied capital to the expansion and integration of national markets um, and suspended the operation of historically normal patterns of capitalist social reproduction. And so uh, this is a broad picture that leads me to, if not be pessimistic, uh, to be a little bit more uh, cautionary um, than my fellow panelists. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so thanks to an accident of history, one of the panelists didn't turn up. We've actually got quite a lot of time for discussion, um, which is good. Um, try and get some audience interaction. I'll just start it off with a couple of questions to the panel, but please try and come up with some questions and um, after, I've, uh, after we do, a I'll do a couple and then hand it over to you guys. First of all, let me just play devil's advocate here. I mean, Sandra says she was pessimistic. If I was going to be a pessimist, I'd say, you know, the Arab Spring was great, but maybe it is the Arab winter. Let's just go through the countries. In Egypt, looks like we're going to have a plebiscitary dictatorship after you know, a couple of weeks. Syria, we've got a civil war with the um, existing regime basically cracking heads and winning, it looks like. Yemen, we've got a regime which is also still pretty oppressive, popped up by the Americans with the drones, etc. Iraq, we've got a sectarian sort of um, democracy, which isn't anything like what we, we hoped we'd see five years ago. Um, I understand there's more, you know, there are some more hopeful signs, but they're the big countries. What, what is left of the Arab Spring? So, I, I'm not disputing Sandra's point, but I'm not disputing all of, of the challenges that exist, and I'm not saying that there aren't enormous amount of work to be done. But let me give you the one country that, you know, if there's in need of a cultural revolution like any other is Saudi Arabia. I mean, Saudi Arabia is the outlier in the entire Middle East in the sense that it is, it's draconian, it's, it lives in medieval times, um, there's a lot to be done. What does it mean when we have thousands and thousands of Saudi students sent to the West to study and are going back in droves to their home country? That's a phenomenon. That's one of the little hairs I'm talking about. That, that is going to shake up the ruling family more so than the end of oil. You have the masses of students we have in, in Canada alone, something in the order of 20 to 20,000 students I heard at one point that have graduated from this country. <coughs> Similar in the United States, in all fields, are going back to their country and saying, wait a minute, I have the, the requisite knowledge, I have the, the pedigree, you know, you can't tell me that you, maybe uh, in, in the 70s it was you know, exclusive to one, to one group and one family that went to elite universities, that's no more. That is a social revolution awaiting. And that's one of the biggest countries I think that needs enormous amount of reform. And I am seeing that today questioning Saudi men. You know, I mean, if anybody's been watching the Twitter sphere, you know, Saudi men making YouTube videos, songs, saying I want my wife to drive. This is, my point is, this is, a, this is something that you can't ignore it and say, okay, but you know, there's a bunch of geriatrics in power in Saudi Arabia. Yes, there are. There are geriatrics in power, in power, and yes, that needs to change. But something is happening at the base that we're not, we cannot ignore. Because then we'll have exactly what Sandra pointed out. One day we all wake up and say, well, nothing, where did that happen? It's happening now. The revolution is happening throughout the entire Middle East. And I think that if you look and see the stories of all of these vignettes, of different people in the region, you wouldn't be as pessimistic. And, and I'm not by any means, I mean, for all of those Saudis have to live under this repressive autocratic regime, you know, kudos to them, but they are literally taking up the challenge every day to go on Twitter, to go online, to challenge themselves, getting in their cars. The other day, there was a, about a week ago, women got into their cars and, and against defiance of the, of the ban against women's driving, which is, again, archaic. That, to me, says something, and again, I am not suggesting that it's not hard and difficult, but I'm saying that there's something there that's happening and bubbling to the surface. And one day, by sheer demographics, I'm saying the top heaviness will be the majority of the population. That'll be youth. 
and they are not going to put up with the old-fashioned ways of politics and society. Could you um, perhaps um, give us a bit of the Tunisian perspective? Because obviously Tunisia is one of the whole four places. Well, I, I try exactly to deal with that uh, kind of contradiction. Since when you look at the news today, when you look at how things are happening, you cannot be optimistic. And there is something to it. And that's what I'm saying, that the short and medium term is going to be very, very difficult. And it's not going to be. But at the same time, there are fundamental things happening. And here, I would like to come to Sandra's point uh, about the roots and the social economic foundations of the old regimes over there. And actually, I, I didn't talk about it here because I didn't have time, but I have written about it somewhere else. Um, the economic and social model that has been prevailing for the last 50 years is, was not sustainable anymore. No, I mean it is not, and I, I have I have I, I have long paper on this and uh, trying to explain why uh, we we have been following the evolution of the last 50, 60 years of the uh, authoritarian bargain and uh, and so on, and then um, talking about the um, predictability of what has happening and so on, um, I explain this in the following way. I my view, my explanation of the dynamic. By the early 2000s, the old system was not sustainable anymore. It was vulnerable because it was not able to deliver anymore on the bargain. And therefore, the old coalition collapsed. And therefore, the social and economic foundation, the roots of, the, of these regimes, is not there anymore. So that's what makes me optimistic, if you like, because not only the so what I will try to add here is that the social economic conditions are not there anymore for these autocratic regimes to sustain themselves, but also the overall the political and cultural climate is changing, which is going to sustain a new direction. So we we'll have a period of counter-revolution, but that's still going to settle. It's still working, it's not, about, it's not, it's not finished. Now, a final comment on, on Sandra, I and mean, my, maybe I didn't explain it. When I talked about the five features, first time we see them together in this combination. We have seen any one of them at different points in time. Even the uprisings, I mean the 1988 the, uh, revolution of Algeria of, was very similar to what happened in Tunisia in 2011 or Egypt. But then the rest was not. We didn't have all the other features. Uh, so what I'm saying that the combination, that combination, that constellation of features, of factors is unique. What did not happen. Even the Iranian revolution did not have that. Sandra, do you have anything? Yeah, just a, uh, a short intervention first um, about the, the old model. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Um, um, <laughs> the old model. Um, I think what I've been referencing, and, and you'll have to correct me because um, it is that um, the model that seems to be historically normal is what we call neoliberalism uh, today. And that's back with the vengeance, and not only through structural adjustment post-conflict reconstructions, um, post-tsunami and disaster reconstructions, uh, democratization, good governance initiatives. Uh, it, they're all the same policy prescription. And um, they're very aggressively being promoted. And they're exactly the opposite of what historically broadened participation in economies and polities in you know, Asian tigers, Japan, parts of Europe, et cetera, et cetera. They are the absolutely opposite description. Uh, just a second point, um, um, but we're, I know we're being filmed. Are we going to be posted on the internet? Because then I won't say this. <laughs> I, I think yeah, things will be on the internet. Yeah. All right, I wanted to say something okay. about the Saudi students. Uh, something I know quite well from personal experience, but uh, I'll forget that. Okay, okay. Just, just one more. Uh, the person I want to reply to that, I want to ask a question about whether there's a Middle Eastern economic model, but that's not what. Yeah, I mean, that ties into it. You know, one of the things that um, is, is, I think, a partial explanation, and I've done some research on this, if I may apologize for, for hogginess, but, 
you know, one of the things that happened during the Arab revolutions was the excess amount of money invested in real estate. If we're gonna link this to the global financial issues, you know, 2003 to 2008, we had an oil boom. And that meant, you know, we saw oil prices go all the way up to $140 a barrel. Now, a lot of that money, capital surplus, particularly from the oil-rich countries, found its way into neighboring Middle East countries. And what did they wanna build? They built towers, they built malls, they built uh, uh, resort villages, they built um, amusement parks. Literally, this was their top priority. And, and the reason why, I mean, as investors, they know how to build towers, it's a Dubai model. I mean, that's what they do. But actually, what it did in the Arab world was create, in fact, more social problems. Because now what you have are malls with young people who we already said are educated, unemployed, know what Gucci and what these brands are, and are walking around. I mean, you can go to Egypt City Stars, you can go to Mecca Mall in, in, in Amman, you can go to all of Solitaire in, in, in Lebanon, and they are these wonderful marvels of modernization. Beautiful, they're beautiful, they're spectacular. But when the people in the majority of the population can't enjoy them, you create problems. And you create problems because people themselves are being told that, look, we're modernizing. So you had Suzanne Mubarak talk about these modernizations in terms of these towers. And you had people toting around these great you know, in investments into malls as somehow that's development. That's not development. That does not create jobs. And unfortunately, if we're talking about where the economic model and new thinking had to be, what we needed was responsible governments in the Arab world at that time, who when an investor came and saw something, they had to ask the question, how many jobs will I get out of that? We didn't have that, unfortunately. It was like, wow, I'm gonna have a bigger tower than Dubai? Bring it on. That's not the way that we should be doing development. And unfortunately, that's the mindset of, frankly, a dictator. A dictator loves to have these big, shiny things in his country so that when Westerners come to visit him or her, usually at him, they see these lovely, shiny towers and think that's progress. That's not progress, my friends, and that's one of the you know the thinkings that didn't get to the to the to the leaders, but yet the young people understood was problematic at its best. Uh, so that I think is something that is another issue to link to the global economy and, and the financial right. models. Okay. Well, Steph, I want to ask you about this uh, this economic question. There used to be this attitude in the West, which I, I think was sort of thinly disguised racism, basically David Landers and people saying that there was something sort of fundamentally antithetical between Islam and modern economic development um, because of the use of rewards, etc. Um, it always struck me as um, being sort of absurd. And some countries, I understand, I'm not an expert on this, but Tunisia has always given us an example of actually done pretty well trying to turn themselves into a manufacturing hub for Southern Europe, I understand, with people moving in their computer companies, etc. Is there a sort of model there which the rest of the region can try and copy? Obviously, you've got the elites problem, you've got the sort of resource curse in some of these countries with Everybody's just fighting over who's going to get the oil wells. Is there a sort of viable North African model that we can look to? Uh, wow. Well, that uh, should have three days for that. <laughs> <laughs> three days. Uh, now, on, on the Islam and development and so on, I think this is uh, just, I mean, all of the research I have seen and all of these, you know, once you account for the, the other characteristics, the fundamentals, the role of Islam and the Islamic, uh, you know, nation is, is relevant for growth and, and, and for development of the region. So that's really a non, a no, no, no problem. Now the question, the real question is, you know, what to do going forward? What kind of development model? And I say it again, I don't like that word, kind of modern development model. I don't know what it means exactly. But what is what 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 is it that needs to be done going forward? And clearly, there is not the same thing. I mean, the, the region is very diverse. Um, I always say, uh, I, I used to say there are f at least four types of countries, and everyone is, is going to be different. There are the rich countries, which have uh, the, the resource rich countries, which have low populations, and they are not very uh, labor abundant, and there are the resource rich, which are labor abundant, like Algeria, like Iraq, like uh, you know, uh, Yemen. And uh, there are the others, and the poor, uh, not resources, and, and they are poor, right. and uh, those are, and everyone is going to be different. However, uh, you know, we know. I mean, I, I don't know. Sandra is 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 really, you know, questioning the whole approach of development and uh, what kind of uh, approach is is best, whether the neoliberal and uh, the, the the kind of program that we have been talking about is really. Right. The way forward or not, and that's 
Stick. Uh
of what knit together real national economies. Um, so I think it was, it, um, and, and maybe Mustafa has a different view of this, but I think- Certainly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I can turn, turn over this page to you. <laughs> no, I mean, 2000, why 2011? I mean, it's certainly not because there is any change in the uh, dominant policies, whether it's neoliberal. There is nothing. I mean, the policies in Tunisia, broadly speaking, they have not changed for the you know last 20 or 30 years. So it's not, not, nothing different. However, what's and and I, I have written my explanation is that what happened, the triggers that made it happen, are two or three very specific ones. One is the unemployment of the university graduates. That has been, over the last 10 years, before 2011, a multiplication by six of the unemployment rates of university graduates. Now, we have to talk about why this is so and, and, and so on. It's not really it's whether it is due to these policies or not, and what are the uh, education policies, and, and so on. So that's one. The second is a huge, dramatic increase in corruption, visible corruption. When, so it's not, no, I don't think so. It's not linked. It's the way the power was captured by this small elite, the family groups, and so on, which was against, actually, it's worse than chronic apathy. And it's not neoliberal. I, I think it's anti-neoliberal. Actually, it was predation against the capitalist system. So, so it is, that's the major second, you know, event, but, but uh, the third, the third feature is the increasing, it's, and, and I think that's common between Egypt and it's the succession problem. It's the political succession problem, which is really what's coming to a head. Tunisia, it's in, not only in, in Egypt, it was in Tunisia, it was in Egypt, it was in, in Libya. It was, where is, what, how is the sections going to be taking place and who is going to succeed? These, it's these things which came together. Thank you, the man back. seven-story billion-dollar house, and it's built in one of the poorest areas of, of Mumbai, and that's the image that came to mind as we talked about the Dubai model of capitalism and the, the seven-star hotels. Um, and do you think, and that's just very symbolic about the, uh, the duality of growth in India, which is that you have stagnant, the, the growths have been incredibly unequal, and there's been a rising amount of uh, civil unrest in India recently, especially when you consider that there's a party that's been probably the most left-wing party that we've seen in a long time that's taken hold of uh, the capital city of Delhi, they're called the Amadmi Party. I was wondering how you see that evolving over the next few months. Anybody want to tackle that one? Um, well, uh, uh, I mean, uh, actually, I mean, I think Basma has written about, you know, how the IMF is trying to, uh, you know, uh, filter in some concerns about uh, inequality and all of that. But what you describe, and what's being described by 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 Vesma and everyone, um, uh, many of you, is, is this you know what what dependency theories call dualism. So it's a very restricted enclave which is utterly foreign oriented, has no impact on very little impact on the rest of it. This, as I said, was how capitalism developed right from the start. That was the model that was developed in Britain and Europe and exported elsewhere. You know, there wasn't any metropole and, 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 and periphery in that respect. That was suspended for a couple of decades after World War II through some Keynesian social democratic compromises that were forced because of the strength of labor. Uh, and elites were watching in the Middle East and elsewhere, and that's why they have these barracks of workers in the Gulf who, if they want to bid up their wages, they're put on the plane and they fly home rather than a citizen workforce. That's, as I said, I think the 50s and 60s was a blip 
That was a rev social revolution, and neoliberalism, again, is a counter-revolution. With deregulation and, and freeing capital from national polities, and so it, it's, it's a, er, that's the recurring phenomenon. And that's why I'm a little pessimistic, because I don't see what it is that opens up, opens that up to transformative change. Uh, and, you know, I'd love somebody to talk me down and tell me. I think that's my sort of point. You know, I think one of the things that frustrates me when we revert to the isms right away, it's not capitalism. It's the people who are in charge, it's accountable governments, because the governments have a choice here. So rather than, for example, in Egypt building a super fast road to get people to the beaches of their, their, their mansions on the north coast, they should be focusing on improving the metro for the populace. That's a, there's a decision being made. When you know governments are choosing to, to allow another mall to be built as opposed to updating the infrastructure in electricity grids in terms of, that's, a, that's an elective choice that governments make. My point is that governments who are not accountable to the people who frankly don't care because they assume that they have this God-given right to be in power, don't question whether or not this is going to create jobs. And what we need are governments in the Middle East to take every part project that comes into the country and ask the one, the one question should be, does this create jobs? Is this inclusive growth? And unfortunately, I think for too long, many governments of the region just resonated to say, well, I'm going to build what I want. And that often was very much right to the top. We had a lot of micromanaging at the very elite level where people wanted to create these really, what they, I think are false symbols of modernization, shiny and new, but didn't necessarily feed the people. And I think there's a lot of ideas out there on what needs to be done, so there's no shortage. It's a matter of commitment. It's a matter of do they feel responsible and accountable to their people. And I have to say, I'm not suggesting that the revolutions by any means were about democracy, because that wasn't about, that's a very liberal connotation that we brought to the game. But I do believe that truly democratic countries do in fact have a higher ability to be responsible about the public purse. And so I think there is need and room for democracy in many of these countries. I mean, public participation in economic development, if, if that's what you say, absolutely. But I think also, we need to also change the, um, I mean, in some way the popular pressure has not meant that they, if they want to be there for the next, you know, how many years they think their role gives them, they need to start thinking about jobs. They need to start providing jobs for the people because I think that's in the essence what people want. It's productive economic work and increasingly meritocracy because they are educated and they're not going to accept, you know, underemployment, which is a real prevalent problem in the region as well. Uh, up in the side there, yeah? Thank you very much. I really enjoy the panel very much. So, uh, my yes, it's comments and questions, but it is either, either pessimistic or optimistic. But actually, this is shown the difficulty to imagine a real future because uh, if you quickly look at the revolutions in the Middle East, together with occupation of Wall Street, all the recent.
let's say, that the kind of the interaction between these two prompts to generate the new thinking. This is the, uh, the question. So how can we have a kind of the long transition through these modelization to the new politics? Thanks very much. Let's get another question with that one as well. Islamist, uh, let's say, uh, Paul Paul. So I was wondering if you could uh, still think of what could be the elements of the, of the, of the social contract or the political concepts similar to the one that emerged in Europe in the 1950s in, let's say, the situation nowadays in the Middle East. Okay, I think there's sort of parallel questions, really. How do we, everybody agrees it's going to be a long, problematic process. How do we keep the long transition going? And is there a sort of social contract that can be constructed there which will sort of underpin democracy or whatever direction you want to go? Anybody? I think uh, th this is really the, uh, the, basic, uh, the basic question. And um, it, it go the, what goes at the heart of the issue is the following, in my, in my understanding, in my understanding of what's happening. Uh, there are two kind of tensions or two struggles going on at two different levels. And one is that the political, societal level, ideological level, which is the secular Islamist struggle. And the one, the other one is at the economic level, at the economic level in terms of which groups are benefiting or will benefit and what kind of new organization of the economy which will and now these two struggles are not really are not interacting well. Yeah. They are they are kind of being played at two different levels, and they're not connected in, in a clear way. And my my feeling that really, and what I was trying to suggest is that once this secular Islamist you know struggle is going to take you know the the outside unuseful part of it it's gonna be worked out within the economic sphere. And what are the social groups which are gonna be supporting which political group for democracy to take root and for the political debate to take place. And this is gonna take time, some time to work itself out. And, uh, and I, I would like to make a comment on, on, on something like that. My belief is that it's really it's not neoliberal against other you know, choices. I think that that distinction between, between liberal and, and no, I think for me, I, I, my belief is that really we are past that. It's really what combination of, and even what has been discussed here in the uh, CG and I, INET and so on, it's really what combination of role of the state and role of, of the private sector which is best and this has to work itself out through the political process. And the, and the dimensions of that political process, what are the players and so on, is still working itself out. And it's gonna take time to work itself out. Anybody else like to comment on that one? Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right. I, I, to, to draw a kind of uh, a, a opposition between neoliberalism and something else, exactly. But I, I go back to something that you just said, and then I think you reversed it, that there's the level of the economic which then plays out the political. But for me, it's the, the level of the social. What changes in Europe is that you know, the aristocracy and their sons get absolutely decimated. Their savings dry up. Um, there's a mass force of, of workers that are mobilized to fight in two world wars. And for the first time, masses of laborers are put together with peasant associations, rural, urban. They're mobilized, radicalized, trained, clothed, fed. <laughs> did much more than any international could do. 
and they were able to see through demands by the time they were mobilized again for the Second World War, uh, right from the start of the war, the trade union, and this happened in the U.S. and elsewhere. We now have moved to professional armies, so that'll never happen again. Uh, elites, uh, elites now in the Middle East, they import uh, uh, Filipinos, etc., uh, and keep them in barracks and send them home if they want to uh, talk about wages. Uh, people learn. I mean, um, uh, I think those who profit from owning what there is to own of value, they learn it and they adjust. So for me, it's the balance of social forces. When does that shift? When there is colossal human and material destruction, like in wars, when there are plagues, like the Black Plague, which decimated third, you know, that sort of thing, where there's a shift in the, in, in the balance of power, which empowers other groups, and it's not, it's not left to, to uh, altruistic politicians or political leaders. Um, you know, uh, it allows for, for a compromise in institutions that, uh, as Emmanuel Kant would say, are, are immune uh, to, to the machinations of, of a society of, of devils. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. We don't, we don't want to leave the session on the notion that we want pestilence and war in the Middle East to uh, hasten the revolution. So can somebody else uh, ask a chef here? Hello, my name is Jan Hörstein from the USS Göttingen in Germany. Germany, as you know, we have a peaceful revolution in to ask that? I mean, is the lack of a Western model which people... I mean, that presumes, of course, that the um, people on the streets are trying to copy the West, which may be a bit of a um, problematic idea, but many, how much impact has the sort of um, legacy of the, the wars and the drones and etc. had, do you think? You should probably touch on it before we leave, finish. Uh, look, it matters, uh, without a doubt. I mean, it's not... You can't ignore it. Um, the Middle East, have, too often, they've seen themselves as pawns and somehow a bigger, a bigger game. Um, so that, without a doubt, it's an important issue. But I, I guess my point is, and I really hope that this comes out, is that the people today are not just referring to these big structural phenomena. It's not to say they don't matter. It's not to say that it doesn't have an impact. Increasingly, the blame is localized. It's being localized to the leaders. And for me personally, that's refreshing. Because I think when you have a blame that's uploaded to this very abstract isms, okay, Westernism, Americanism. I mean, you don't, you can't do anything about it. those. Are big, you know, huge um, mega structures. But the reality is, so much of the problem and the accountability is in the hands of the leaders at the local level, and by that I mean the governments, the national governments. And that, to me, the Arab Spring has been, I think, an important aspect of the awakening to bring down, to downgrade, if you will, responsibility onto those who really do matter at the end of the day decide that I don't want to build a factory, I want to build a mall. That's not Americanism, and I don't want to blame neoliberalism. At the end of the day, you have an opportunity to make a decision. Leaders have an opportunity to make a decision about what kind of productive society they want to create. And too often, I think we use some of these structural explanations as a scapegoat. Okay, I think that's a good note to end on. It's at least two of our three panelists are ultimately optimistic. So let's end on that optimistic note and uh, thank them for a very interesting discussion.